good to see you here this morning. As I'm looking out, people are not sitting in their normal spots. <laughs> Boy, the, the pews being God has wreaked havoc on people's normal spots. I've got people that normally sit on this side sitting on this side, people in the back sitting in the front. I don't know what I'm going to do this morning. You're probably wondering what you're going to do also. Despite the fact that we're going through some inconveniences here uh, for the next few weeks, and let me just assure you that things aren't going to get any better over the next couple of weeks. They're probably going to get worse. Uh, hey, it's a good thing. We're moving towards progress. Uh, in, in about a month, most of this should be done and over with. And when you can go back to your normal spots and feeling good about where you're, you're normal. Yeah, we're just happy that you're here to come to worship with us on a Sunday morning despite the inconveniences that are present on a day like today. Uh, there was a, I was just told that I need to make an announcement that our VBS, I mean, it's not in the bulletin, and uh, we kind of uh, overlooked that a little bit, it starts on Tuesday at 6 o'clock from 6 to 8.30. So if you have kids or uh, no kids in your neighborhood that would like to come, it's going to be a great week. I'm be sure you've seen all of the advertisements for it out in the foyer. And uh, we would love to have you and your kids come. And if you're an adult and you just want the night off, date night, Hey, you know, go drop some kids off and mom and dad can go out and get a burger or go out and have a nice romantic dinner and without the, the, the presence of kids. Hey, we're the babysitting service this week also. We'd love to have you come out. This morning we've been going through a series in the book of 1 Peter. Uh, this morning we're going to be in chapter 3. Last week we talked about a very difficult subject that uh, you know, I didn't just beat up on women, I beat up on men also. This idea of submission in the marriage context. Remember I said that submission is not just a woman thing in the Bible. That submission is a man and a woman thing in the Bible. That we are to submit to one another and to the marriage relationship. While that's been misinterpreted for years, that sort of women, you know, you, you do all the submitting and men you just sort of do all the lording over. Well, that's not really the uh, context to which the Bible communicates that we are to submit to one another. Well, if you didn't get that sermon, go on online and check that out because that's going to segue into a lot about what we're talking about today. We're in the middle of the series through the book of 1 Peter, but in the middle of that, we're talking about marriage and some of the things that the Bible highlights as to what makes a godly marriage and what things we should be looking at as spouses to enhancing our marriage and, and, and making our marriage more in line with what God defines marriage to be. So this morning we're going to continue that as we look at the same verses we looked at last week. And really we're going to look at those, well, the final verse, verse 7 of this Pericope of Scripture next week. And so uh, next week is Father's Day and I'm going to talk a lot about men next week. So come back and hear uh, what's happening with what God says men need to do in the context of the marriage relationship. Let's go to the Lord and ask Him, invite Him to speak to us through this time this morning. Heavenly Father, I do thank You for this chance that we have to uh, come together and study the Word of God. And I pray, Lord, that in this moment, that first of all, that You would be honored in our time together, and secondly, that You would just hover over this place with Your Spirit, speak to us, Lord, challenge us in some things that we need to look at in our own lives to become the people of faith that You really want us to be, Lord. Just uh, Lord, please make your will be done in this place this morning. We ask it in your name. Amen. There's a song that we like to sing in the Williams household. Uh, I've been singing it really ever since my daughter was born. Uh, and uh, I, I sing it at least once a week to my daughter at some point. It's, you know that old Joe Cocker song, You Are So Beautiful to Me? Not much to it. Because you are so beautiful to me. You're everything I hope for, everything I need. You are so beautiful to me. And I go in, she has a piano in her room, and I, I play it on the piano. Sometimes she'll be awake, and this is how I wake her up in the morning, playing You Are So Beautiful to Me. Uh, I play it simply because, first of all, I don't play the piano very well, and it's an easy song to play on the piano. But secondly, like most parents, we uh, would like to affirm the beauty in our daughter. We, we think that it's important that my daughter believes that she is a beautiful person. And so by singing this to her and reminding her of her beauty, I think that's one way that we can affirm that to her, that her dad is willing to sing a song, say, hey, babe, you are beautiful to me. 
But the question comes up when we start thinking about you are so beautiful to me, what is beauty? It's a good question, isn't it? Because beauty has been something that really has changed if we're looking on an external uh, sort of plane. Beauty has changed throughout the centuries. It changes from culture to culture. In fact, within our own culture, if I were to ask you what somebody who is beautiful is, yeah, I would probably, if I had 10 different people, I would probably come up with probably 10 different answers on what defines beauty. So if you were to look at it from a global perspective, I have some pictures here of uh, different cultural contexts of what constitutes beauty. If you go to an Asian context, in, in out the history of the world in the Asian context, the idea of having a pale face or a very white face was important for Asian women to be believed as beautiful. Why? Because it meant that they weren't from a working class. See, the people who would work would be out in the sun, and they would be getting tan, and they would become darkened. And so to have a wider face is something that constitutes even more beauty. And so they'll even paint their face really white to highlight something that's beautiful. That really goes against sort of our American concept of a slight tan, you know? No tanning salons, I guess, in, in that culture. Then you can go to, uh, you look into like an African culture right there. I mean, in, in some African villages, by the time you hit puberty, your bottom teeth as women are knocked out. And then they drill a hole in your lip and they start filling that hole with little plates that get bigger and bigger. And the bigger the plate, the more beautiful you are. Now, how many would like that, women, you know? If we be putting some plates in your lower lip, she's gorgeous. She's got a huge plate, right? <laughs> No, uh, most of you probably wouldn't go for that. Uh, you can go into other places. You can see in some cultures, a, uh, a longer neck is more beautiful. And so you put gold on the neck to elongate it. And the more rings you have, the more beautiful that you are in the Middle East, sort of covering the head and covering all of the body and just having a small area to, to see a face, that's considered beautiful. You can go... Um, in times in, in the history of the world, in poorer villages, they thought that um, heavier or stout women or uh, large women were more beautiful because it meant that you were healthy. It meant that you didn't have to go out and work. You weren't hungry. You got to you got to eat a whole lot. In fact, I was just recently in Africa. And somebody who was from a small village, a tribal village, was in one of my classes, and we were talking about cultural definitions of beauty. And he said, yeah, we like them big. And I said, well, that's not really an American thing because the American model says something totally different. He said, no, big women mean that they are wealthy women, so we want to land a big woman. <laughs> All right, that's just what the model of beauty is. But then you come back to the United States, and it's a little bit different. You know, you've been programmed since you were a child that Barbie is beautiful, right? That the slight tan, sort of long flowing hair, elegant accessories, just the right amount of makeup, just the right amount of skin exposure, that is beautiful. We have this sort of Barbie mentality in the United States of what constitutes beauty. And because beauty is so important for women, not only of our culture, but of all cultures, we spend Lots of time, lots of money trying to give ourselves sort of that extra edge when it comes to beauty. In fact, I, I get it. Women really feel that they have to be perfect to, well, perfect outwardly, at least to compete in this world. You walk into a mall and you have these beautiful models that are portraying the finest clothes and, and dress just right. They have the most expensive items on. You, you're told constantly that you got to have the right nails. you got to have the right white teeth. You, you've got to have the most expensive clothing. Your toenails need to be perfect. Your smell needs to be perfect. Your eyelashes need to be perfect. Your jewelry needs to be perfect. Your body has to be perfect. In fact, I start studying on Monday for my sermons. At least get sort of an idea of where I'm going so I can sort of process through the end of through the week. And I started watching TV and after starting my st study. And as I watched TV, I, it came to my attention just how many commercials deal with beautification. I, I mean, go home and this week, if you watch it, you will be surprised. Now that it's on your radar, 
just how much the TV is telling you your teeth aren't right, your eyes aren't right, your body's not right, your nose isn't right, your wake up isn't right, and you can buy a product to fix all the details of your life. In fact, go into Walmart and just check out. You got a health and beauty section. Look how big that section is. Then start thinking of all the products in Walmart that are given to make you look better. See, our culture is obsessed with being externally beautiful and dealing with this adornment that is outside. And often, that fixation and that obsession causes us to completely neglect the inside. Because we've been so focused on the outside. The biblical message, however, is not so much on the outside. Let's start taking a look at what's going on on the inside. What's beautiful inside the heart. See, the Bible calls that an imperishable beauty. You know, anything that is beautiful, and that is physical, that is external, in a hundred years, whatever you do today to yourself, is it going to be beautiful? It's not. <laughs> in fact, probably in 20 or 30 years, some of that stuff is going to kind of fade away, and that beauty is going to pass if you're looking on the outside. But internally, we should be becoming more and more beautiful and more conformed to the character and the nature of God. That's really what Peter outlines here in 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to draw your attention to this text. Look at what it says in verse 1. It says, Likewise, wives, we went through all of this last week, verses 1 and 2, be subject to your own husbands. And if that text worries you, as I said, go online and listen to that message from last week. Will alleviate some of your fears. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Don't let your adorning be just external, the braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. See, what Peter is doing here, he mentions those words twice, conduct. Verse 1, he mentions conduct, and then later in verse 2, he mentions it again. And he says the emphasis that you should be highlighting in your life when it comes to beauty is not just what's going on about outside and, and, and all of these cultural nuances that we have. It's not about putting another ring on your neck to make it longer. It's not about making your face wider. It's not about having the right eye shadow. It really has to do with adorning on the inside. In fact, he mentions three things. He mentions braiding of your hair. He mentions jewelry. And he mentions clothing. Now, you might look at that and say, oh, braided hair. I'm in trouble. You know, I came to church with braided hair. Is everybody going to look at me? I don't know that Peter is being literal here. Some people have tried to interpret that literally. But if you interpret that literally, we automatically have a problem. Can't braid your hair. I don't know what you could do with your hair, what's in and what's out. Can't wear jewelry at all. I don't think that's what he was talking about. And even if we take it literally, women, sorry to let you know, you can't be wearing clothes this morning. But you know, and he talks about those three things. And if you have this, and Peter's emphasis here, it really would be quite shocking if we followed him literally this morning. And so it's not, though, if you're doing these things that you are in serious spiritual uh, 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 calamity and you need some serious spiritual reconsideration in your life. What Peter is really trying to convey here, I think, is that in his culture, like our culture, people were obsessed with external issues. In Peter's culture, women were constantly being forced into an external picture of what was beautiful. And, and Peter's saying, wait a second, we don't want you to fixate completely on this external. You have to look and see what's going on inside you and what you, would, uh, what you look like on, uh, on the inside. That's really what counts. And you say, yeah, Pastor Chad, I do that. I really we, I, I tell people, it's not on the outside, it's on the inside that what is what counts. You might say that and believe that in theory, 
But then you go and obsess with how you look on the outside, right? So I hear people say that all the time, but it doesn't line up with how we act in our culture as we become so obsessed with this external appearance that we have. You see, Peter thinks more highly of women than your society does today. Do you realize that? Peter wants women to be free from this overbearing pressure and even obsession that is placed on women to constantly look perfect. Women are to be much more than something just to look at and say, ooh, I like that. And so he tells them, stop obsessing about the external and maybe put some more emphasis on the internal. Julie Williams, she read an article I, I read this week. It's called The Art of American Indulgence. It's a little bit of a read, but I, I want to read it to you so you kind of get the picture of our obsession with the external. She, she really nails it. She says this. She says, I catch myself standing in the aisle of fill in the blank of whatever superstore you shot at, standing in front of the eyelash brushes, Pricing them and contemplating seriously which one to buy. Reading the back of the packages for the instructions, awaiting some tidbit of information on how to properly separate and declump my mascara. This speaks to me on so many different levels. First, it tells me that my natural eyelashes, unclumped without mascara, are not alluring enough. Second, it tells me that even if I were to wear mascara, clearly there is a specific method to follow, which undoubtedly I am not doing correctly. Hence the need for an eyelash separator, distinctly different from the one already provided to me inside the mascara bottle. Before I continue, I should probably let you know this. I was there on purpose, specifically for this reason, to buy an eyelash brush. You see, I wanted to look nice, so no, scratch that. I wanted to look attractive. I wanted to look beautiful, striking, and sensual. All for my boyfriend, of course. I wanted him to look deeply into my perfectly separated eyelashes and say to himself, this woman is beautiful. In fact, she's the most beautiful woman I've ever dated. So, here I am. Standing in the aisle of my superstore looking for an eyelash separator. Are you with me? An eyelash separator. <laughs> and I finally realized how absurd this is. First of all, I'd taken the time out of my day, spent money on gas, put mileage on my car, and stood in front of a product contemplating the array of choices before me. Because there are, believe it or not, an array of choices of eyelash brushes. Second, I was willing to spend money on this item. And third, I honestly believed, if only for a moment, that I could transform my beauty with this product. Does that resonate with anybody? I mean, that's part of our culture. I don't know much about eyelash separators. I don't know much about uh, this whole idea of having the perfect eyelashes. But this is the culture that you live in is telling you you need to improve on every part of your physical characteristics or you won't be able to compete out there. And, and with that in mind, we become obsessed with the external beauty. The Bible says, wait, slow down. Don't obsess with those things. That's number one on your outline. If you're following along this morning, I put on your outline, I need to be careful that I don't become obsessed with external beauty. That I don't obsess with that. That that doesn't become the thing that drives me. And by the way, I'm not saying that, you know, what the Bible tells us here, you know, I'm not saying that the Bible is saying, hey, women, you just sort of let yourself go, become frumpy, and, and, and don't really take any pride in your physical characteristics at all whatsoever, and go to your husband as you're, you know, you let your body go and say, hey, baby, love me as I am. I'm not saying that. And the Bible's not saying that either. But it is saying something to the effect of we can't be conformed to our culture that is telling you, you have to be this certain way or you are not beautiful. Beauty in God's eyes is remarkably different 
than beauty in our culture's eyes. And, by the way, I'm going to bring you men into it. Because men are doing the same thing. We are. And we're trying to look and be obsessed with our beauty as well. I was looking up some things online this week of how men are trying to transform their bodies to attract women. And I came across it. My wife caught me looking at it yesterday. She's like, what are you looking at? Calf implants. Have you heard about that? Calf implants. I, was, I came across them doing men beautifying themselves, you know, this thing. And calf implants came up. I guess it's a big deal that's going on right now. This guy on the left, his calves aren't big enough. So he goes to the plastic surgeon, and now he has those perfect calves right there that are surely going to win in extra dates, you know? Now, listen. I, if you have calf implants here, God bless you. I hope you're loving your legs. Okay? I, I'm not going to criticize the calf implants in and of themselves. Listen, if we do that, we become legalistic. But in my mind, what I got to thinking is, okay, if we're going to spend that much on just a calf, this part of your body, I mean, I don't know, women, are you looking at this part of men's bodies? I, I just don't know. If we're going to spend and obsess on just this part of our bodies, are you obsessing that much on the transformation going on inside? It's not just about the external calf implants or makeup or anything else. The question is, if I'm concerned about the outside that much, am I really obsessed with the inside and what God is doing inside of me? Am I worried about, you know, heart surgery or obsessing with soul implants, you know, to become more like God wants us to be? We've got to be concerned how to make the hidden stuff inside look more spectacular, too. And in the long run, that's the stuff that's really going to count. In fact, our culture is duping us, telling us you've got to have all these other parts of your physical body perfect. And the Bible says all of that's breaking down. Get the inside perfected. In fact, that's what Peter says here in this next verse. Look at verse 4. It says you've got to adorn the inside. He says in verse 4, he says... But let your adorning be new calves. Does it say that? No. Is it new jewelry or, or anything else? Just the right mascara? No. It says let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. As that heart surgery again. With the imperishable beauty. What? That beauty that's not going to fade. I don't know if calf implants pop or something, but those things are going to, they're, they're going to deflate it sometime, and it's not going to be inflated forever. It's all going to fall apart. All the external is going to fall apart. But he says the imperishable beauty, and what does he say that imperishable beauty is? He says a gentle and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. The idea here is stop being obsessed with the outside and start making yourself uh, turn inward to the adornment that makes us more like Christ. I don't know if you've been like, I've known some people in my lifetime, I'm sure you have too, you come across people and you look at them and, and, and you, your first sight, you, you know you're going to meet somebody and they are absolutely just beautiful people, you know, quote, beautiful people. You, you know, you say, hey, that's easy on the eyes, easy to look at, right? And then you get into a conversation with them. And then we go out 10 minutes into the conversation, you man, that is repugnant. <laughs> you, you, how, you know, that's easy on the eyes, but I can stand being with this person more than 10 or 15 minutes. I am glad to get away. Anybody ever had those kind of experiences? I, I've had those experiences. Then I've had the inverse of that, where you look at somebody a little rough on the eyes, a little homely, and you think, man, that person is just an amazing person. They are beautiful. I could hang out with that person all day long. I enjoy this person. What a beautiful characteristic that this individual has. That's what the Bible is saying here. The gentle spirit, the humble heart, the right kind of character like Jesus Christ. And when it comes to the context of marriage, men and women, what is easier to be married to? <laughs> Think about it. That's what Peter is saying. Oftentimes, men, we go after that physically beautiful.
beautiful on the outside characteristic. We've been bought into the culture. And really, that gets old real quick if there's nothing going on on the inside. And so what Peter is saying to wives is don't chase the outside. That's not going to please your husband forever. He's saying to men, men don't go after just the outside. That's not going to be pleasing forever. If you're going to be in a long-term relationship, there has to be some beautiful stuff going on on the inside. And you have to follow the characteristics of Christ to make that, that, that beauty and foster that beauty inside of ourselves. And by way of application, let me just consider how much time we spend on our outside compared to the inside. Think about it here this morning. Now, you all look great this morning. I mean, look at you. You're all crunked up and ready to go. It's Sunday morning. You all got your Sunday vest on. It's easy to look at out there. Okay? Some of you spent some time on this. You know, I know that didn't just naturally happen when you got out of bed this morning. You spent some time on it. I don't know how much time you spent. Let me ask you, how much time did you develop yourself spiritually this morning? It's a good point of analysis, isn't it? I mean, you, you probably do this every day. You go to work, and you look good on your way to work, and boy, you walk in the front doors, and the eyes are on you. But as much time as you spent to look that way, did you spend time with the Lord, asking Him, Lord, make me more like you, sharpen me, let me be more conformed to your image, let me walk according to your ways, let me become the person you want me to be, help me to have a gentle spirit and a quiet heart and all these things, help me to be the person I need to be, my husband, have you, did you, have you been working on that? See, it's easy to fall into that trap of just working on the external and not working on the internal. And secondly, by way of application, let's think about it this way. You think God looks down at you after you've crimped yourself and spent three hours looking pretty and spending $300 on a dress and God looks down from heaven and goes, Wow! <laughs> she blows me away this morning. Or man, those calf implants, I didn't do a good enough job. And he got that. Do, you think, do you think God does that? I don't think he does that. I think you think about the things that God has seen. He has seen the, the great intricacies of the universe. He knows what beauty is. He doesn't, you're not blowing it away by your, 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 your beauty. He wants you to address your heart. He's looking at the inside of you. But all throughout our church history, and all throughout the history of humanity, we have constantly fallen back to that position of the outside. In fact, you know, if you look in the Old Testament, there's a, a verse in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Israel had this very same problem, not with a woman, but in fact with a man. In fact, they were picking their first king. And as they're picking their first king, this guy comes along, and, and, and he's really impressive. You know why he's impressive? He's tall. I could have been the first king, I guess, of Israel because I'm not very tall. But according to them, that day and age, a tall king was a very desirable thing to have. And so here comes Saul. His name is Saul. And he's really a tall guy. And, and all the people are looking, whoa, that is, that is a king. If ever there's a king, that's a king. And he's super tall. Let's do it. He's our man. He's super tall. And... You know, if you know the story of King Saul, you know that that didn't work out that well. Tall kings aren't always the best kings. And in fact, Saul turned out to be a very lousy king. So Israel picks another king. This time, Samuel, who was the one who was God's prophet at the time, goes and he's getting ready to pick another king. And he goes down to Jesse's house. And Jesse's sons all come parading along. And Jesse's first son, he is impressive. How do I know he's impressive? Well... The Bible actually rebukes Samuel for choosing him based upon his stature. He comes along and he's got the you know six-pack abs, he's tall, he's, he's muscular, he's handsome. And Samuel is impressed and he says, hey, you know what? This is our next king. If anybody looks like a king, this is our guy. Listen to what God says to Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel, you got it wrong. Do not look on his appearance. Or on the height of his stature. What's he doing? Samuel's doing what they were doing in the past. And he says, Samuel, you have messed up. I don't look at those things. In fact, he goes on and says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? He looks at the heart. Do you know when God looks at you, 
He's not looking at your eyelashes. <laughs> he is looking at what's going on inside. God is not impressed by outward beauty. He has seen the most indescribable things in the universe. He has seen the most beautiful things in the universe. Hey, and you walk in with some nice heels. He doesn't go, wow, she's got nice heels, nice legs. He doesn't do that. Think of what God has seen. And it is interesting that we spend so much time and effort just making the outsides right. And God is saying, that's not a problem to make your outsides right, but you're neglecting your inside. And, and the Bible says that God doesn't take note of those people, that God is surveying holiness. And that's beauty to God. The character, that's beauty to God. Those are the things we need to look at. In fact, you go back to the Garden of Eden. God made Adam and Eve, okay? No beauty standards at that point. God made Adam, and he said what? It's good. He said it's good, right? Then, presumably, it was good with Eve as well. The first people. Now, do you think Eve was running around the garden, squeezing pomegranate juice to make her lips redder? You know, I mean, I want God to make me look good. Or I want God to think I look She didn't. She didn't have any makeup. She didn't have any jewelry. Bible says she didn't even have any clothes. And yet... What made her good and beautiful? Holiness. Made in the image of God. Striving to be like God. She was perfect at that point. By the way, that is the real Miss Universe. The one and only Miss Universe. And, and she probably didn't look like our Miss Universe today. Thinking about how she looked. I don't know how, what she looked like, but I can't imagine she looks like Miss Universe today. But that is beautiful to God. Because she was like God. She was holy in many ways. And perfect in every way. See, God looks at the inside for real beauty. And without the right character, the Bible actually speaks rather pejoratively of our beauty. In fact, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 22. Look at this verse. It says, like a gold ring in a pig's snap is a beautiful woman without discretion. You know what the Bible calls somebody who's not concerned about the inside, but is only concerned about the outside? A pig snap. The ring of a pig snap. Think about that. Now put, put a ring in there. You, you know, does that really clean that up? Does that really make that a whole lot better? No. It, it doesn't. And yet the Bible says basically, in thinking in terms of the Jew as well, a pig was an unclean, foul, despicable animal. You're talking about being a snotty swine. <laughs> if all we're doing is working on the outside and not working on the inside. So God cares about things like holiness and purity and character. And here's the thing, people. It's not only our generation. It's almost every generation that is inside of this. Whether it be a plate in your lip whether it be rings in your neck, whether it be a white face. Listen, we've got to emphasize what's going on on the inside. Even Proverbs 31, King Lemuel writes this in verse 30. He says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. What's important to God? What's beautiful to God? See, if you want to be beautiful for God and be beautiful for your husband's, you need to be looking at what God is doing to you on the inside. I'm just concerned about the external beauty. I put number two on your outline if you're following along this morning. I need to recognize what represents beauty from God's perspective. I need to recognize what represents real beauty from God's perspective. And let me just say parenthetically, ladies, some of you in this place have been told your whole life that you're not beautiful based upon the cultural standards. But let me tell you this. If you're serving the Lord and you're trying to exemplify Him in your life and in your relationship with your spouse, and, and you're really trying to put on His character, you need to stop listening to the call of your culture that is constantly berating you and telling you that you're not beautiful. It is simply not true. The biblical definition is a lot different than the cultural definition. And let me tell you, the cultural definition is garbage compared to the biblical definition. And some of you ladies have been beat up for so long. You need to stop that. Stop allowing that to happen and start saying and believing. I'm beautiful in God's eyes. And I know that's important, especially for women. They want to feel that beauty. 
But beauty comes from what God says is beautiful, not what your culture says is beautiful. Because even a hundred years from now, those standards of beauty are going to change. In fact, some of you uh, thin ladies would go over to this African village where a stout person is beautiful. And it would completely change the notion of what is beautiful. But in God's standard, in every culture, in every generation, he says, this is beautiful. I'd rather be that, have that imperishable kind of beautiful beauty. Notice, notice this next uh, verse. What, this is exactly what Peter says here. Look at how specific Peter gets as he outlines specific traits that Christian women should adorn themselves with. Let's go back to verse 2, all the way back to the second verse of this, this segment of Scripture. It says, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, okay, there we are, there's that conduct again, do not let your adorning be external. We already mentioned that. Drop down to verse 4. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of, listen, a gentle and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. They adorned themselves how? Not by makeup, not by uh, uh, jewelry, not by... Uh, all these other things that we strive after. He says, but they, they adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Look at the kind of adornment Peter is talking about here. Instead of body work, what does he say? Pure conduct. Instead of hair work, what does he say? Gentle spirit, which in God's sight, he says, is very precious. So, question for you ladies, are you dealing gently with your husband? Are you dealing gently with your children? Instead of bling and jewelry, what does he say? That you need to use words like submit and yield and serve. Those are characteristics of Christ. Again, going back to our message last week that applies to both men and women. Instead of all kinds of clothing, he says you need to do good. Those are the kind of adornment that the God is looking for. This is what is really beautiful in, in, for God in, 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 in how women should respond to God and to their husbands. And I want you to note one last thing here. Look at this last part of this verse in verse 6. It's really a peculiar thing that Peter writes here. He says, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Isn't that kind of a strange thing to throw in there? We've been talking about beauty this whole time, and then he says, by the way, don't fear anything that's frightening. But what are you talking about, Peter? Well, I think that's a really telling phrase, because to do the things that are outlined in this text, to be submissive, to obey, to yield, to really honor your husband, is sometimes a fearful thing for women. Saying that those are the things that are really beautiful and trusting God to believe that those are the beautiful things rather than what the culture says is beautiful. That can be fearful for a lot of women who are saying, oh, Lord, I'm taking the plunge here. I'm going to submit to my husband. You don't know what my husband's like, Lord. You know, uh, that's, that's kind of a fearful thing. In fact, you want to know why I believe it? This is why I'm interpreting it this way because I go back to he talks about Sarah. Everybody here might not know who Sarah is. She's an Old Testament saint, married to Abraham. And in the Old Testament, God comes to Sarah and Abraham, and God says to Sarah and Abraham, you're going to have a baby when Sarah was 90 years old. That's always a fun thing. And that's the context to which Abraham calls, or Sarah calls Abraham Lord. See, in this text it says, be like Sarah, who called Abraham Lord. There's only one place in the Old Testament where Sarah called Abraham Lord. And by the way, my wife doesn't walk around when I wake up in the morning and say, Good morning, Lord Chad. Do you want your bacon and eggs? No, that's, she doesn't do that. That's not literally what we're talking about here. In fact, if you look at Sarah, she's pretty sassy sometimes when she comes to her husband. You know, she's not the most, you know, uh, she challenges some of his assumptions from time to time. But what is he talking about here? She calls him Lord. Well, in this context where she calls him Lord, it's when the angels come to Sarah and Abraham and say, you're going to have a baby when you're 90 years old. Let me read the text. Look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 9. It says, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, 
will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. She was 90 again. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have indeed the pleasure of bearing a child? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? And say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? See, what happened in this moment is Sarah's laughter was an indicator of her unbelief. And what is, how does God respond, saying, Sarah, is anything impossible for me? I think that's what Peter is trying to convey in this text, that in order to receive the blessings that God has for your life and for your marriage, there might be times that what he calls you to is laughable. You say, what? Are you kidding me? You want me to act this way towards my husband? My husband, he's a louse. You know, my husband, he's not a good guy sometimes. My husband, he, you don't know who I'm married to, Pastor. And yet the Bible still says there are some things that you should be doing and ways that you should be acting towards your husband that do all of these things that are outlined here in 1 Peter rather than just be consumed with an external appearance. Sometimes I know that those are difficult, and sometimes those are hard to believe that God would want us to do those. But as people of God, listen, we have to say, I will trust God's way, that he will keep me safe in this relationship. He will keep his promises to me in this relationship. I need to follow his principles first. Sometimes we do that with fear, not knowing where our relationship's going to go. Not knowing if it's going to be fixed. Not knowing, you know, thinking our husband, he wants me to look this way. And I'm going to work on working it out and making myself look all this attractive to him and et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to give all of that up. Not give it up, but I'm going to put emphasis on things like yielding. That's laughable, isn't it? Hey, listen, that's fearful. I get it. But this is what the word of God comes down to, isn't it? Do we trust his way? Do you trust his definition of beauty and honor his principles and believe that if you follow him, he will do the impossible, like give a 90-year-old woman a baby? Do you believe that? It's really more than just a beauty issue. It's a trusting God and his word kind of issue. Last thing I'm going to outline this morning. I need to always trust in God's definition of beauty. I need to trust in God's definition of beauty. And if you're striving for beauty, which I believe most women are in our culture today, here it is. It's not the definition that you would find in culture, and this is why it's hard to follow these principles in marriage, but if you want to be beautiful wives, and by the way, I'm going to get to husbands real deep next week, so on Father's Day, isn't that ironic? We need to consider how to be beautiful for God and our husbands by God's definition of beauty. We need to apply God's standards and God's way to our life. Listen, this week I, I did a whole lot of painting around here. There's tons of remodel stuff that's going on. Less time studying this week, more time painting. But as I was painting, uh, I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to painting. I, I, I know it's not my skill set. But there was somebody in our church who really, really knows what they're doing when it comes to painting. They've been doing it for many, many years. And here I am. I got a brush, and uh, I'm in the back hallway, and I'm doing this thing. I got all the wrong material. And he walks in, and he watches me for a while. And he tries to do it very kindly, and he does. He says, you know, let me just give you a little pointer here. I can help you out. He says, first of all, you're not using the right kind of brush. And secondly, you're not brushing it the right way. And thirdly, you're putting the paint in the wrong kind of container. And uh, pretty much, you need to change everything you're doing with how you're painting if you want it to turn out well. He said it very kindly to me. And I could have done several things with that information, couldn't I? I could have said, what do you know about painting? Which I already knew. He knew a lot about painting. I could have said, you know, uh, no, that's okay. I am content doing it my way. 
And I, you know, if I do it your way, I'm going to have to change everything I know about painting. And I really, I don't want to do that. I'm 40 something years old. I've learned by painting this way, and by golly, I'm going to keep painting the way that I've learned and painted my whole life. I could have done that, and it would have turned out really horrible, wouldn't it? Or I could have said, you know what? This guy knows what he's talking about, even though I don't understand the intricacies of painting, and even though this doesn't make sense to what he's telling me to do, uh, you know, because I've been doing it this way, and it seems to be working out just fine for me. He says, you can actually do it better. I don't understand that. But you know what I did? I said, okay, I'm going to trust this guy's word. He knows what he's talking about. Listen, when it comes to the word of God, your culture is telling you a way that you've been doing it year after year after year, and it's been programming you for all the years of your life of what beauty is. And God is saying, we need to do a little deprogramming. We need to start looking at what God says beautiful is. Women, I know you're under such tremendous pressure to be beautiful on the outside. I know that's a struggle. You don't need to be under that pressure. You know what you need to do? Just love Jesus. Follow the Lord. Strive to be like Him. And be beautiful. We put so much angst in so many things in our culture, and we've been doing it wrong. We're stressing over the wrong way. Let's start following God's way. And I know that those principles, we might even laugh at. You, these are the principles, this godly way. You think that's going to get me by in this culture? It might not get you by in the culture. It'll get you by in God's eyes, which is far more important than how you please your culture. And not only with elements of beauty, that comes with salvation, too. See, the biggest trust that you can have is trusting in the Lord. Trusting that Christ came to save you. Christ came to give you eternal life. That he actually says that you are doing things wrong if you are doing it without him. Do you realize that? If you are doing life without Christ, he's like that painter friend of mine. He's coming over to you this morning and saying, hey, you know what? You're doing this wrong. Can I help you with this? So that you start doing it right. And he says you need to start trusting in me. And that you have to turn from your present way of life. And your current way is a dead end. You need to change and follow him. Not just in marriage. Not just in finances. Not just in these certain areas of life. But you need to kind of change everything in your life. And start following the Lord. Really that's what this text reminds me of. Is that. As we talk about changing our standards of beauty, we need to start thinking about what God wants to change in me. And for some of us, that's about everything. He wants to turn us upside down and make us different. Have you trusted him, even though that's laughable? Are you trusting him to do it his way? Let's pray this way. One question before we spend some time worshiping the Lord for a couple more minutes is how do you feel about your beauty? Think about that. Are you finding your value and your worth in Jesus Christ? Does the Lord say when he looks at your life in the inside, does he sort of sing that song, perhaps, you are so beautiful to me? Or are you kind of that ring that takes snap? What have you been highlighting in your life? Maybe you need to make some adjustments in your life. I'm not sure where you're at with the Lord on that. I think we all need to make some adjustments. We're constantly being called by our culture to be something that we shouldn't be and wrestling with what the Word of God says versus what our culture says. Just to give you food for thought this week, think about how much time you're spending on external duty and how much time you're spending on internal duty. Maybe you're here this morning and the Lord has spoken to you in some way or form in this message or 
Maybe you've already had some things going on in your life and you came into this place with some heavy loads or some burdens that you really wanted to take to the Lord today. We always take a few minutes at the end of our service to just worship the Lord together, sing a song, let people come and pray, give people the opportunity to accept the Lord. I don't know what's going on in your life right now. If you've got some heavy loads, heavy burdens, some things you need to have somebody pray with you about this morning, I would invite you this morning to come and pray with somebody. In the front, we have people here who would love to pray with you and show you from the scriptures some truths that you can apply to your lives. Maybe you just need to come and pray over some stresses, some worries, some needs, some physical ailments. But most importantly this morning, maybe you're here and you can't think of that time that you've trusted the Lord with all of your life, that you've given your heart completely to Jesus Christ. Or you said to him, Lord, I see that I've been painting the wrong way. It's time for me to follow your path. And you can't think of that time and place that you have invited Christ into your life. I would invite you to submit to him this morning. Say, God, I'm yours. I'm doing it your way. We have a prayer here at the church that we invite people to pray with us. Inviting Christ into our lives. Look up on the screen if you'd like to pray. It says something like this. God, I need you and I admit I'm a sinner and I've done things wrong. And I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died in my place. Paid the penalty for my sins. And here's where it's important. I'm willing right now to turn from my sins. Accept Jesus Christ to be my master, king, the Lord of my life. I fully surrender myself to you. Take control of me and help me become the person you want me to be. Thank you for loving me. Amen. You prayed that prayer this morning the first time. I would love for you to just come and talk with somebody. They're going to give you.